Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much, as always, for being here. Under normal circumstances, we will be talking today about whatever happened in the Europa League game against PSV last night. It was scheduled to take place last night, but of course, because of everything that's going on in the UK uh, and London in particular at the moment, that game was postponed. It has been rearranged for mid-October, where the Manchester City game in the Premier League was supposed to be, but that game, of course, will have to be rescheduled at some point in 2023. Yeah, end of the season, title decider, Arteta versus Pep, Master versus Pupil, hat tricks for Bakayo Saka and Gabriel Jesus in the most enthralling title decider anyone has seen. Erling Haaland's five goals in one game mean absolutely nothing. So that's all to come next year. So, you know, don't start holding your breath now, but do remember where you heard it first. In a moment, I'll be talking to Tim Stillman about the few bits and bobs that are going on from an Arsenal perspective. But later on in this very show, I will be chatting to former Arsenal chairman David Dean, who's got a book out at the moment. It's called Calling the Shots. It's on release. So I chat to David uh, about the book, about his Arsenal career, the Premier League, the formation of which he was uh, very much involved in, and lots more. That is coming up in a little while. So stay tuned. As I said, though, we're going to chat about the few bits and bobs uh, regarding Arsenal. And of course, the Arsenal women's season kicks off uh, tonight, Friday, 16th of September. And who better to give some lowdown on that among the other stuff then tim stillman hello tim hello there we will get to the arsenal women in due time but there's a couple of bits and pieces (laughs) there's a few bits and pieces that i just wanted to talk about before we did that i uh ben white not in the england squad for the upcoming nations league games Uh, and i wondered if it was an injury or something like that but andrew uh, allen told me hasn't been in the last two squads i'm quite surprised by that actually given his a, the level of his performances this season, which are clearly superior to the level of performances which got him into the England squad for the European Championships, and his versatility as well, given that Gareth Southgate does seem to like a defender, mm. maybe he you know, could think about a guy who can play in a number of different positions for him. Yeah, I wonder if it's a little bit, because I, I kind of wrote half-jokingly on Twitter the fact that he's been playing at right-back should kind of attract Gareth Southgate, if mm. anything. How many right-backs were there in the Euro squad? About five. Um, <laughs> but that that's probably the reason. It Probably the reason is, uh, you know, Ben White's a right-sided centre-back who can play right-back. And England have got about 100 of those, mm. uh, particularly in someone like Carl Walker, Reese James. They can all kind of do that job where they play in that similar area, whether they're playing centre-back or right-back. I, I guess, and, and look, I understand as well, the international squad places, it's not like player of the month. It's not like a reward. You have to fit into the overall team and everything like that. But I, And so on the face of it, someone like Connor Cody being in and Ben White not being in doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because I know who I'd rather have in my team. Mm. But then again, if you're putting a squad together, maybe Connor Cody's got some qualities which are not reflected elsewhere and Ben White has qualities that plenty of other players have. But yeah. I think the one that slightly confuses me is uh, Gwehi from from uh, Crystal Palace. Yeah. Um, ahead of Ben White, because they seem to me to be quite similar players, albeit I think Gwehi plays on the left, but but Ben White just seems better. I don't know. Like, Mm. I know it's, it's it's a very crowded squad, particularly in his kind of area, and he is a little bit unfortunate there. But I have to say, looking at that list of defenders, I can perhaps understand why he's not a starter or anything like that. But I don't understand how he doesn't get in at all. And I do think that I, I, basically my view of England is that they're coming to the end with Southgate. Um, that it really, to me, it looks like it's burning out a little bit. I've got this like, this is the end of the cycle. Like after the World Cup, someone else should just take over and try and do something different with this team. I've got that real impression with Southgate. And I, I wouldn't mind betting that he might leave after the World Cup and then another manager might come in who might be more amenable to someone like Ben White. Mm. I suppose the thing from an Arsenal perspective, you know, uh, is uh, given the way the fixtures are lining up, particularly in October, it's not a bad thing for us 
um, if he's not going away on international duty because we've got another player who's going to be uh, fit and fresh for what is the probably going to be the most hectic part of the season, uh, the, the, the most hectic part of the first part of the season, I think after the World Cup. There's going to be plenty of catch-up going on, and we don't quite know what the physical condition of the players who go is going to be like. We don't know what the physical condition of the players who stay is going to be like, because they've never had to take six weeks off in the middle of a season before. But for this group of fixtures coming up in in October, maybe it's a good thing. And and similarly, the three Gabriels, um, Martinelli, uh, Magalhaes, and Jesus are not going away with with Brazil, um, I did see you chat about this a little bit on Twitter, but just for sort of clarification, people are pretty convinced Gabriel Jesus is going to go. Uh, mm-hmm. Big Gabby at the back is going to go. Does this end Gabriel Martinelli's chances of making the Brazil World Cup squad? I don't. It, I don't think it ends it, but I, I'd say it's it's a slightly worrying sign. Um, people might know that Chite, the Brazil coach, was at the Fulham game a couple of weeks ago, and obviously him and Edu, um, they aren't just former colleagues; they are best friends like when Chite took the Brazil job one of his conditions with Edu comes with me or I don't take the job that's how close they are mm. so they're, they're good friends and I wouldn't mind betting that you know a bit of that conversation Edu might have just you know elbowed him in the ribs and gone why don't you leave Jesus at home because we've got the North London derby but call up Richarlison um, and take him <laughs> and, and, and then let him down and don't call him up if you could do that for me that would be very nice um, yeah. but that obviously the the problem for Martinelli is just the unbelievable depth that Brazil have in those wide forward areas, which is part of the reason that Gabriel Jesus made a very smart decision to become a number nine again. Mm. That's why he's going to go, because well, not just because he's very good, but because he can play through the middle. The, their depth is such that Roberto Firmino is probably not going to get in. So they, you know, for, for him to go, yep, yeah, okay, you can actually play as a number nine. Because what they do, their first choice front three is Vinicius Jr. on the left, Rafinha on the right, and Neymar in the middle. And that's not necessarily because Rafinha is like the best. Mm. It- because he provides something different. He's like a very natural inverted winger. And that's why Anthony is a big danger for Martinelli, because he's actually quite a good kind of analog for Rafinha sure. as well. So again, Anthony might not be a superior player to Martinelli, but he more closely fits slots in. Yeah. Then of course you've got Richarlison, who is again big competition for Martinelli because he's he's very similar. He's that kind of wide forward who's really a, a forward and they've just got loads of those. Um, so I don't think the doors closed on him, but Martinelli was in the three squads before this. So I think it's more a case of, okay, I know what you can do. I need to look at like a player like Richarlison who's been in and out. That They have called up Firmino for this squad, but I really think that's a, you've really got to pull a rabbit out of the hat um, to get in the squad. They're also having a look at a young uh, striker called Pedro who's playing quite well at Flamengo at the moment. So I think those are guys who are probably not going to go, mm. but are given a last chance. And, you know, they can't have 20 attackers in their squad, so someone had to come out. But certainly the case is more precarious for Martinelli than his two namesakes. Mm. Shame you can't have 20 attackers in your squad. That would make for a very entertaining team. <laughs> I mean, if you did, Brazil would win it. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 uh, Brazilian attackers versus uh, 20 Gareth Southgate defenders. Uh, there's a game I think we'd all enjoy. But the, the serious point, I suppose, is when we look at this international break that's coming up, there are going to be players who go away. There are going to be players who are playing in competitive games. Bakayo Saka for England in the Nations League it's it's Germany and Italy in those games so it's not like you're playing you know Luxembourg and San Marino you know you're going to have to work really hard in those games I don't really know who everyone else is playing but we have to kind of keep our fingers crossed when you look at nine games in the space of whatever it is 30 days in October it really is a very very punishing schedule um and I think what's kind of interesting about it is It is absolutely going to require Mikel Arteta to rotate his squad in the smartest, most sensible way he can possibly do it. I know we've got some issues. We don't really have the depth where Partey plays if he's back. You know, um, who else is injured? Smith Rowe, of course, is injured. We don't know quite what his situation is. You know, Smith Rowe and Martinelli, you could one in, one out, one in, one out. It's quite good. Um, 
So we don't necessarily have all the depth we would like, but there are going to be some decisions, particularly around the Europa League games, where he might feel he has to, he wants to go a bit strong, but because of the opposition, because we're maybe playing an away game after an away European game, he's going to have to really trust in the squad um, in a way that maybe we haven't really seen under Mikel Arteta up to now. And this is this is going to be an interesting month to look at from, from that perspective, let alone the fact that we've got nine games yeah definitely and a lot of those players are going to have nine games and then go to the world cup and what's that going to do even psychologically i mean in in the very short term someone like martinelli not getting in the brazil squad i bet he'll go hell for leather next month he'll want to play every minute of every game because he wants in that squad badly um but you might have guys who are just like oh if i even if i pull a hamstring now World Cup's gone yeah. uh, kind of thing. So it'd be really interesting to see that side of it. But this is where like a, a player I'm fascinated by is Fabio Vieira, just because he can play, by the looks of it, by what we're told, three different positions, mm. but three positions for guys who usually play every game. So he can play basically Saka, Erdegaard and Xhaka's roles. And those three guys are pretty much always in the starting 11. Yeah. So what he can do... Uh, Like he could theoretically end up playing pretty much every game just by filling in for each one of those players. And and that's, that's actually something we really missed last season. We had too many guys who played one position like Cedric, like Tavares. And then when we needed them, we hadn't played them for months and months. And that really showed. Whereas having like squad players who can play a couple of different positions, I think it makes so much more sense because they stay involved. So someone like Fabio Vieira is going to be very important. And then like uh, Marquinhos's performance in Zurich, Mm. hugely promising, hugely promising. Not because he's ready to start the North London derby or anything like that. But if it means we can give him 20 minutes at the end at the end of the game personally i feel pretty reassured by the idea of him in the europa league starting lineup yeah. now like even when we play well we're not playing psv now had we been playing psv tonight i'd be i'd be comfortable with him starting and and obviously that's a lot of information to take off the back of one game but one of the things maybe we forget about marquinhos is like he's not completely green um, he's not completely wet behind the ears he did play for sao paulo last year it's not the same level but he was playing, you know, men's football. We haven't plucked him from, like, it's not a Martinelli situation where he's come from the Brazilian lower leagues. He's not come from the youth. Like, he was playing first-team football for Sao Paulo. So there's something that, like, physically he should be fine, essentially. It's it's a quality question, and, and I think he showed in that game that, um, that he's definitely got quality. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and you know, what I saw, like, I'm not one of those people who will um, – jump to YouTube the minute we're linked with a player. Unlike some people I might mention. I don't know who we could be talking about here. But, but you know, I, I saw uh, people talking about Marquinhos and they were saying, like, looks like plenty of raw ingredients, but maybe the decision-making isn't quite there. Maybe he doesn't get his head up enough. And I didn't really see any of that in that performance. I know he's been with us since the summer and there's been coaching and training and those kinds of things. I mean, when you make your debut and you score a goal and you get an assist uh, and probably should have had another assist as well, you can be very pleased with your performance on an individual basis, but also to be able to do that. And I thought he played really sensibly in that game. Mm -hmm. He didn't play like a raw 19 year old who's been given his chance who goes right I'll show these I'll show them what I can do it was it looked like a very structured coached performance that he executed almost to the letter yeah absolutely absolutely I I was really impressed for that reason like I I don't know what I was looking for but I wasn't looking for him to go and try and score a hat trick or anything like that and obviously he did get a goal um, but I think you're right there was a there was a level of uh, kind of it was a measured um, performance mm. in that respect. And and obviously he's not exactly the same as, as Saka, but you can certainly see like a lot of those qualities, the way he's got a lovely little kind of um, lilt on the ball when mm. he kind of lifts it over to the back post. And that so one of Saka's most underrated qualities, I think. I think we always try and get Saka in that area on the corner of the of the penalty area because his delivery 
is so good from there, or he can combine with Erdegaard. I, th- I think um, we've seen that Marquinhos' delivery is very good from there. I, I guess, I mean, we didn't really see him play with Erdegaard in this game. I, I guess the question would be, you know, how would that relationship work? Because we know that Saka and Erdegaard, you know, they come together as, yeah. a, as a pair, really, on that right-hand side. And, and obviously, we, we haven't seen that yet. Um, but I think definitely the raw ingredients, like he should be on the bench for Premier League games and, and he should be an option to bring on, even if it's we're 2-0 up, there's 20 minutes to go. We you know we don't need to burn Saka out here. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's the, look, we're making a lot of assumptions or what have you based on one performance, but... You know, there were circumstances, for example, last season where, you know, the 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 game state did not suit someone like Nicolas Pepe, right? So you, you need yep. to make a sub or you want to make a sub or you're trying to protect Bakayo Saka, but you know that when you're 1-0 up away from home and you're having to defend, that's really not Nicolas Pepe's strength. I mean, the Aston Villa game last season is a perfect uh, example of that. Um I don't know if Marquinhos is like 100% a better option in that sense, but I just, you know, I just think that to have that little bit of depth there where we were very worried about it, we didn't make the signing that we thought or hoped we were going to make before the end of the window. Like if it if it emerges from a player that we bought earlier in the summer, um, I mean, there's no bad thing about that. No, absolutely. And a, a player I was wondering a little bit about after the deadline anyway was Reese Nelson, because obviously he's he's kind of stayed. And I thought, OK, do, you know, is this a bit of a can, can he do the Inketia season? You know, can he do that? <laughs> well, his contract's winding down. He looks like he's on the way out and then all of a sudden burst into life. Obviously, the circumstances are very different because yeah. Reese Nelson plays in Bukayo Saka's position. Eddie Inketia played in Alexandra Lacazette's position. Mm. I think we can, without wishing to be unkind, we can acknowledge that those are two very different things. Um, but, I, you know, I did wonder about Reese Nelson. Like, okay, maybe maybe he, you know, not a big role, not a glamorous role, but maybe he takes another step towards the squad. He's obviously playing for a contract probably somewhere else mm. um, at this stage. And so, you know, maybe he comes back in. But I think what this Marquinhos, at least this performance, and look, he could play next week and he could be rubbish and this could all change. But <laughs> I, I think really it takes Reese Nelson out um, at this stage. It kind of, if you're Mikel Arteta, it kind of says, well, who am I going to invest in here? Yeah. The guy who's on his way out or the guy that we've just we've just bought? Um, so I, I, I think it the, at the very least does that. Mm. Um, and and yeah, totally. I, I'm I'm really enthused about. I, I think um, I'm I'm really open to seeing us take more of these gambles, particularly in the Brazilian market, especially where we've got such a Brazilian um, kind of connection and presence at the club. That is hugely important. That's hugely important. The Brazilians that succeed in England are almost always the ones who have other Brazilian players around them. Richarlison had it with Jorelio Gomez at Watford. Gabriel Jesus, Fernandinho was huge for Gabriel Jesus. When City signed him, Pep took Fernandinho to the meeting um, with Gabriel Jesus. It's a big, big thing to mm. have those those kind of other, other senior Brazilians around. So I think in that respect as well, Marquinhos can be really well looked after. It's it's interesting you mentioned Reese Nelson. I do think you're right to say he's playing for a contract elsewhere. Um and I, you know, I think maybe had he been fit before the end of the window, he might well have gone out on loan. But given that we are up in the air a little bit about the fitness of Emile Smith Rowe, we can't, as much as he might want to uh, play every minute of every game, we can't put that kind of burden on Gabriel Martinelli. So I do wonder maybe if if Reese Nelson might be an option for that left hand side. Um, in the Europa League games, I'm not talking Premier League games at all, but if we're going through um, nine ninety minutes in in October, like you've got to maybe make some imperfect decisions, if not quite square pegs in round holes, slightly rectangular pegs in. Oh, I don't know. I don't know another shape now. I can't <laughs> think of hexagonal. I don't fuck it. This is terrible. But you know what I mean? He could Definitely. do a job there. And, and I think actually um, for the Premier League games, for the wider role, probably Eddie Nketiah is closer than someone like Reese Nelson anyway. In whatever form that takes, whether that means Gabriel Jesus moving wider and Nketiah up front or mm. whether they swap or whatever. Like if I'm in Nketiah, I'm probably looking at the forward line and going, oh, I'm probably not getting in ahead of Gabriel Jesus, mm. but 
there are other spots for me in there um, potentially to to get my minutes. So I, I think he could become a really important player in October in whatever role, um, in whatever role that might entail. Sure. All right. Well, look, let's move on to uh, the Arsenal women whose season kicks off uh, tomorrow. Well, today, maybe as people are listening to this Friday, the, the 16th. How has the, the summer gone from um, a squad building perspective? Mm. Yeah, so what Arsenal have done, basically, um, the squad last season was was too big. Obviously, it was Jonas's first season. There are a lot of players there who weren't really his players. And I asked him about this in his press conference on Wednesday. And there was something uh, in January called the Asia Cup. So Arsenal lost uh, four players in January to the Asia Cup for the whole of January. So he kind of explained that there were players who might have gone in January, but he kind of had to hold on to Mm. just in case. And Arsenal signed three players in January. So they had a busy time and they've had like a bit of a clear out of squad players. So quite a few players have left, but not really many minutes played there. The the kind of the the issue, I say the issue, he, he said, um, to me that he wanted one more player in. He feels the squad is one player light, and it is. I, I think maybe two, but definitely one. Um, so they brought in um, a Swedish forward called Lena Hurtig, who's mm-hmm. a really good signing, um, really, really kind of good pedigree from Juventus, paid quite a bit of money for her in women's football terms. But they, they wanted one more, and I do think they are one light there. In, the in is, attack, is that what you said? You think they need one more up front, or is it... Somewhere else. I, either up front or in midfield, um, or preferably someone who could play both. Maybe I think basically they're down a high-level utility player. Right, the, like the starting eleven, or at least the the fourteen or fifteen is quite set. And the advantage is that that's all stayed together. Lots of new contracts signed. The core of the team is the same. Almost certainly the starting eleven on Friday will all be players who were at the club last season. So they've got that stability they didn't have last year because last year they had nine new players across the season and a new coach. So lots of upheaval. They've settled that right down. That's a good thing. But mm. they are, I think, one player short. And I, the, the women's um, transfer market this summer has been crazy. Basically... Uh, the way I see it, there's a big supply and demand issue because there's more clubs now that are willing to spend, but there aren't enough players. So what you've got is big clubs trying to buy off each other. And obviously that's really, really difficult. Mm. Um, so that it's every every player, it feels like, is a massive fight, essentially. And, and so it's true that Arsenal missed a few targets this summer, a few big targets. And uh, there's a little bit of angst um, in the fan base about that. But when I look across, everyone missed their big targets. Barcelona wanted Vivian Miedema, happily didn't get her. Mm -hmm. Uh, They wanted Gilles Raud from Wolfsburg, didn't get her. They were trying to buy two of the best players from two of the best clubs in Europe. Couldn't do it. Chelsea really wanted a defensive midfielder. They were willing to break the transfer, the world transfer record to get one. Didn't do it because they're trying to drop by from PSG. So they offered £500,000, which would have broken the women's transfer record, uh, to buy one of their defensive midfielders. But it's PSG. They don't (laughs) care about £500,000, frankly. So a lot of teams missed their biggest targets. So I think what Arsenal are trying to do now is is try to find the inefficiencies in the market. And they tried to bring in a couple of players towards the end of the window but they're not they were non-european players and work permits were difficult um for both of them so i think arsenal have basically taken a little bit of stock they missed a few targets because they lost players to barcelona and chelsea and they've kind of gone okay mm. we, we need we need to look a little bit wider here and they tried to do that but but then those transfers are then very complicated to do um, just to finish this ramble, they did yeah. bring in another player, uh, a Brazilian player called Gio. Um, but that, that, so where Jonas said he thinks he's missing one player, I think the player he means is Gio, and she's a forward who can play across the forward line. But she's gone on loan to Everton, and that deal would not have happened without that loan. She's 19, she's brilliant, stacked full of potential. But the Women's World Cup is next year and she's on the cusp of the Brazil starting eleven, and she wants to break into it. So she didn't want to come and be a squad player at Arsenal at this stage. So a stipulation of the deal was that she went on loan to Everton where Ah. she would play. 
That's interesting. So, yeah, I was going to yeah, ask so you why that was. You know, was it like, is this strategic squad building for the future? But um, yeah, you got to look after the player if they if they've got their ambitions as well. You know, absolutely. So Arsenal didn't really want that, but without that, they don't get the player. So long term, they've got one of the most exciting, probably one of the top three teenage talents in women's football but they don't have her this season and they wanted her this season. So it's been a bit of a mixed bag in terms of the transfer window. All right. Well, that'd be interesting to see how she gets on at at Everton. I mean, it's, um, it's quite the journey, you know, from Brazil to Barcelona to, uh, to Merseyside. Um, That'll be a test of her ability as, as a footballer as well. Well, she's she's actually got um, a very kind of varied background because she moved to the USA when she was four. So she was born Ah, in Sao Paulo. Right moved to the USA and then when she was 14 she moved to Spain and she was at Atletico Madrid and then Barcelona so she's got she's actually got triple nationality right um, so she's well used to like she's got suitcases in the hall ready to go exactly, at any point yes. All right. well people will keep an eye on that so look what is the what is the realistic expectation for um for Arsenal women this season what are their I mean obviously your goal is to win all the competitions that you're in but what's 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 the feeling within the squad about, you know, what they can do? How confident are they that they can go better than last season? Um, and and is, the, is the ability to respond to a season which maybe ended with some disappointment, is, is that there? Is that part of their, their DNA, if you like? Yeah, I'd say there are three main targets for this season. So one, target every season, win the league. Um, They lost it by one point last year and at half time on the final day of the season, they were top of the table. Um, So that's how close they came last year to Mm. winning it. And obviously with Chelsea in the league, that's that's a difficult ask, but Arsenal are good enough to to make that challenge and they should make that challenge again. Mm. They're a bit more settled under a new manager. It's more his squad now. So I expect them to definitely to challenge and you know, they need to win it. They haven't won it since 2019. That's one target. Second target is to go better in the Champions League. So they were knocked out in the quarter final last year. Now, realistically, Arsenal are not in a place to win the Champions League at the moment, I don't think. But they can definitely push towards a semi final, maybe even a final. Frankly, if the draw works out for them, mm. um, I think Barcelona and Leon are probably. You know, that would be too big an ask um, for Arsenal to beat those teams. Everyone else should be on the table for Arsenal to beat. Last year, they went out to Wolfsburg in the quarterfinal. They deserved to go out. They were thoroughly outplayed in the second leg. That's got to improve. So improvement in the Champions League is another part of it. And obviously, they had Barcelona in their group last year and they were thumped twice by Mm. them. So, you know, there's a good chance they'll end up playing them again. So don't get done four goals by Barcelona this time. <laughs> that be, sounds familiar. <laughs> be, yeah, it would be a reasonable target. But the third one, I think a bit of an ancillary one, they have to win a trophy, I think, if it's one of the domestic trophies. They haven't won a trophy since 2019, which is incredibly unusual for Arsenal women. Even when they went through a bad period and weren't challenging for the league, they were winning cups. And I think I really think they've had a bit of a mental block. They were they were thrashed out of sight in the cup final last year by Chelsea. It was probably their worst performance of the season. They weren't themselves at all. And like they have got to a lot of finals in the last three years, but they keep losing them. Mm. And I really think they've got to get over that mental block. And something I really hope helps them is obviously they've got three um, of the England players who won sure. the Euros. And they've got uh, Rafaeli, who captained Brazil to the Copa America. And I really, really hope that one of the things those players can bring back is I won a final, you know, at Wembley in front of 90,000 against Germany, which Mm. is stacked with Wolfsburg players. And I really, really hope if we draw Wolfsburg or if we're back at Wembley in the cup final this year, that the experience those players had can just say, do you know what? I arguably, well, not arguably, frankly, in women's football, international football is still the kingmaker. I won on a bigger stage than this. I won a bigger game than this. And and I really hope that that kind of permeates throughout the squad a little bit because I think they've got to get rid of this slightly mental block in sure. some of those bigger games. I mean, I think we saw we saw like lots of the uh, the teammates at Wembley that day as well. So, you know, they saw um, Leo Williamson, et cetera, do the, do the business. 
And that's got to be part of the motivation as well, though, is it? I want some of that. It's not not going to be at, at international level, but at domestic level, you know, knowing you've got that quality, knowing you've got these players, got those characters in your squad who are there front and center going to lead you, you know, it, it, it will be motivating, but also give you confidence that you can do better. And absolutely. And, you know, we're not talking about players who are cleaning boots and giving out half-time oranges. We're talking about the captain mm. who played every single minute of the tournament. And we're talking about the top scorer and player of the tournament, yeah. Beth Mead. So, like, it doesn't get a lot more emphatic than that. They had a big role to play. And similarly, Rafaeli for, for Brazil, um, she captained Brazil to that. She's a centre-back. They didn't concede a goal in the whole tournament. Big deal for them um, as well, and big deal for her. So, yeah, and and Jonas was saying on Wednesday, you know, there was a time in the quarterfinal where England were 1-0 down with five minutes to go, and they get an equaliser and they win in extra time. And he was saying he really hopes that helps Arsenal as well because he said that one of his big focuses this season is that mental side. So he kind of said, look, if, when it's 85 minutes and we're 1-0 down, I want these players to still think they're going to win the game. Mm. If we get like a crap refereeing decision or something, I want them to forget it and go on and win the game. He still feels that sometimes in adversity, they, they're too quick to... I mean, he didn't say it in, th- in that strong terms, but do you know what I mean? He was saying, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I want them to believe they will win. And, you know, frankly, they won't every time, but you've got to believe it. And that's the the side he really wants to develop. And and I really think what those players did this summer can help with that. All right. Well, fingers crossed. If people want to find out more about the Arsenal women, uh, in particular, the uh, the team that we've got, the squad that we've got, you can head over to Arsblog News. Tim's written the uh, squad profiles. You'll find it there on the dedicated section to Arsenal women. But, um, you know, for people who are getting on board with the women's team, maybe after the summer uh, and the, the big sort of lift that women's football got if people are um, coming on board to the Arsenal women for the first time what can they expect throughout the season from you guys over on Arsblog News yeah absolutely the the whole package so we do match previews um, we do match analysis pieces so uh, brilliant Twitter account I very recommend you to follow uh, Medema stuff um, does graphics for us and we kind of pull apart the matches and analyse them we speak to the manager before and after every single game without fail. We get exclusive player interviews as well. Um, we get exclusive transfer news. The Geo transfer, we broke that um, exclusively on Ask Blog News. We do podcasts twice a month. The most recent one just had Ian Wright on it. Um, so we get like a really, really good quality of guest. And you'll see by the time this goes out, we've got an interviews on the site with Leah Williamson and Hafaeli ahead of the beginning of the season. So, yeah, it, you get the absolute full package and we do post-match videos as well. And we're going to do a little bit more with the videos this year now that um, now that things like COVID-type um, restrictions are, are really, really gone. Mm. We can do a bit more with the post-match videos and hopefully get some players involved uh, on those as well. So pretty much everything you can think of in every medium you can think of. (laughs) If we can figure out a way to just teleport the information into your brain through like some kind of microchip, we'll try and do it. Yeah, that doesn't sound at all sinister or Big Brother-ish, <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure some people would be into it. Uh, that's where you'll find it, Tim and the team over on Arsblog News, and you can find the dedicated section for, for Arsenal women there. Everything is there. And, uh, you know, hit up Tim on, on Twitter if you have any questions about the team. I'm sure he'd be happy to deal with them. Uh, as always, Tim, thanks very much. My pleasure as always. Thank you very much indeed to Tim. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Stilberto, at Stilberto. And as we said, you'll find the best coverage of Arsenal women over on Arsblog News. Nobody does it better and in more depth. So if you are following Arsenal women this season, make sure you make the women's section on Arsblog.news your reference point. Okay, joining me now on the Arsecast, I'm delighted to welcome somebody whose name you all know very well. He's a former vice chairman of the club, and he's got a brand new book out called Calling the Shots. It's David Dean. Hi, David. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Can I ask you first, did you enjoy the process of putting the book together? I I really did, Andrew, and it's my first time at the rodeo. I've never written a book before. It probably be my first and last book. Uh, It took about a year from start to finish. And I chose my ghostwriters very carefully. I had Amy Lawrence, who you probably know, knows everything about Arsenal there is to know. Uh, So she did my Arsenal life. 
and another prolific uh, writer, Henry Winter of the Times. He did my my early life, my business life, and my life after Arsenal. And it was about shared, I guess, 50-50 between the two. And what was that, a series of interviews and then obviously trying to, to guide those interviews and directions based around, yeah. I guess, the, the sort of most um, eventful moments in your in your career and in your life? Well, there were hours and hours of, of recording in which they put together. And, um, and I must say I'm very pleased with the outcome and I hope all the readers will be in due course. It certainly gets released today and um, I, I hope everybody enjoys it. It certainly, um, I, I had to bear my soul. In fact, one of the, uh, uh, Amy and Henry both said to me, look, um, you're going to have to tell the whole story here. I said, well, you know, I'm very, you know, my private life is my private life. There's certain things which are very sensitive to me. And they both convinced me. They said, look, it's your autobiography. You've got to tell, you've got to purge your soul here. You've got to, it's, it'll be cathartic. You, you really have to say, tell everything. And actually they prized out of me a lot of things which I wasn't going to talk about. Was it, was it cathartic to relive some of those? <clears throat> Well, basically, I, Andrew, I mean, I've never spoken for 15 years about my leaving Arsenal. So that indeed was, well, I mean, that, that uh, and I felt it was very private. I didn't want to talk about it, but I did. Then there was an incident where I got defrauded in my business and that I hadn't spoken about for over 30 years. But, um, you know, that's a, that's a chapter in the book. A lot of things that um, we were talking about with uh, on England trips and things like that. So I think it is interesting. I think it is. I like to think that it is amusing in parts because I love humour. I like to think that that comes out well. And there's ups and downs. Like in everybody's life, you have reversals. So it's. Um, um, it, I hope I, I take the readers on a, on a, on a good journey. I want to. I'll come back to you on the on the Arsenal stuff uh, and the topic of your departure and and what happened there in, in a few minutes. But I want to start maybe by talking about the Premier League. And you speak about the the formation of the Premier League. You were very, very much involved in that. And it's sort of framed around, uh, in the book initially, it's framed around the events of Hillsborough, which um, people will know, and a personal experience you had with two of the victims at Hillsborough. I'm just sort of curious as to, to how, when you were thinking about the Premier League as a concept, clearly lots could have been improved in English football at that time, when it comes to stadiums, facilities, broadcasting, all kinds of things uh, were involved in that. But how much of a catalyst was Hillsborough to uh, what eventually became the Premier League, in your mind at least? Yes, I certainly think the uh, the night that I went to see Jenny and Trevor Hicks at their home in Hatch End, that was a seminal moment that, uh, in many respects, a huge wake-up call I think for everybody involved in football, you know, to think that here uh, football cannot be about death. And when I uh, went to try and console them, this was before the Premier League, don't forget we're now talking about in 89, and um, and it's all, it, it's all graphically illustrated, and even when I talk about it now and I think about that conversation with them, and in fact, Jenny Hicks was brave enough uh, to come to our launch on Monday. You, you weren't there, were you? At the no. Came- so we had a wonderful, wonderful launch on Monday night at the Cambridge Theatre. It was for every seat was sold at 1,200, 1,200 people. Um, and I, I deliberately asked her whether she would be uh, up for coming on stage, and she did, because I thought she had a phenomenal, uh, a major influence on the formation of the Premier League for me personally, because I felt that football couldn't be about that. It had to had to change. You know, the voting structure was all wrong in, in the league at the time. This is the old football league with 92 clubs and in the four divisions. Um, and uh, you couldn't make progress. You couldn't make effective change. So uh, but Hillsborough was a big influence in my decision. You are a businessman. So there was obviously, uh, as this idea sort of germinated and came to fruition, you know, you talk about it at one point in the book where 
um, you're influenced by what what happens at American sports. So you go to the stadium and there's uh, concession stands and there's food and there's drinks and there's beer and all that kind of stuff. And it's about giving a better experience. I mean, the the one that comes across most is that there's somewhere for people to go to the toilet, which is you know fairly important when you when you're at a football match and you're drinking beer. But you give the the example of like the. I think it was the average spend at Highbury at that time was one pound fifty, and the average spend at the Emirates now is is twelve pounds twenty five, something like that. And you know, as a businessman, were you able to see the modernisation of football as an opportunity, not just for Arsenal, obviously, but for the game itself? Yes, uh, but there was also something, Andrew. I was keen to make sure that the fans had a pleasurable experience. They're going to primarily a place of entertainment. Obviously, it's a sport. You want, and the first thing you have to think about, it's got his safety. So we learned a lot of lessons from Hillsborough, as indeed we did, by the way, from uh, the, the men's Euros, you know, uh, in 2021 at Wembley, which, which didn't, didn't go well, as you're aware. Mm. Um, but certainly, and it's unfair to compare the two, but certainly the Hillsborough uh, and the state, really, it, it, it was the, the state of the facilities in the grounds were not welcoming. People used to come at 10 to 3 or 3 o'clock just before kickoff and leave at 20 to 5 or 5. That was before even a 15-minute half time. Mm. That about six meetings before we could get that through. I remember putting that up and said, and so one major club said, well, what's the, what's the manager going to talk about for the extra five minutes? <laughs> What about the fans going, going to the loo and being able to have a cup of tea or coffee or beer? What are, you know, you think of them? Wasn't it the money aspect would follow? You know, once you once you got the facilities going, you got so you got more outlets. It was more convenient. I mean, did you ever think that the Premier League would be where it is now? You know, with the changes that came into effect. The new broadcasting uh, deal with Sky and there's, you know, a very good section in the book about uh, how that came to pass between ITV and BBC and the way that they viewed the rights and Sky as this new company came in and got it. But like, here we are uh, 30 years later, 30 years down the line and the Premier League, you know, there are things about it that maybe some people aren't too keen on in terms of some of the ownership and and uh, the way that football clubs, some football clubs are run. Was that something that you even considered back then? I'm not saying, you know, it's possible to predict the future, but it's sort of like a, a Pandora's box in a way that has led us to where we are now. I think the answer to that question, firstly, is that uh, the attendances in the 80s were going down the drain. It was year on year they, they were going down. And if it had been any other business, you'd think, well, hold on, this business is not sustainable. Something had to change. Uh, you know, the stadiums themselves, they, they were old-fashioned, so they needed renovating. And it was thanks really in large to the Lord Justice Taylor report when it came out in 91 that made clubs go all-seater. And all of a sudden, the game changed, that it was a much better environment to go and watch a match. So when we formed the Premier League, all we knew we had to do it. Nobody could ever believe that now you, the Premier League get £9 billion over a three-year span for, mm. for their vision rights. Obviously, nobody had that idea. And I, I remember saying that we knew we had, and, and it was documented, that uh, we, uh, the expression I used, that uh, we had an aeroplane on the runway. We didn't know how high it was going to fly. And it's gone to the stratosphere. You know, and it's gone year on year. It's, it's going out now to our 195 territories around the world. It is England's fastest growing export. Uh, it is, and you know, I was on a plane the other day, I think I mentioned it, going from uh, from London to Istanbul on Turkish Airlines, and I'm watching Liverpool play Newcastle live 30,000 feet in the air. So that tells you the demand for the product. Sure. Times have changed in a, in a big way, haven't they? So. And the, the Premier League of now, uh, you know, it, it is um, such in such demand that everybody, everybody want, around the world um, wants to watch it. What do you make of suggestions, uh, you know, that maybe something like the ownership at Newcastle, the ownership at, at Manchester City, 
you know, we've seen previously with with Chelsea, with Roman Abramovich and, and subsequently what happened to him, that the Premier League perhaps is being used in a way, you know, to, sports washing is the phrase that's used. It's obviously great for teams like Manchester City, fans of Manchester City, fans of Newcastle. But do you lend any credence to the idea that, that these owners are using Premier League football clubs to present an image of themselves to the world, which doesn't necessarily tally with how they behave or how they treat people? people at home if you like i think i think as long as they're good owners no matter where they're from that's fine i mean you know i don't think one can be selective when you're choosing you know living in a, a free society where you know shares can be traded on, on openly and that's where it has to be um uh, i mean you look at you think of, of the name of Rolls Royce as being one of the foremost bastions of of England, right? As, as a name, who owns Rolls Royce these days? I think it's BMW of Germany, right? So you know, the ownership does change. Mm. They got majority of owners now in the Premier League are non English. That that's the way it is. But as long as they are mindful of the culture of the country and particularly of the fans. That is so important. What is the game without the fans? And Andrew, I always say this, that um, whatever we do, we've got to be, we've got to listen to the fans' voices. They've got, they, they may well be the, seeing a stadium with empty seats wouldn't be much fun to anybody, and particularly for the television companies or the sponsors. So it, and I know when I was at Arsenal, the, the end of each season we'd have a meeting discuss ticket prices and i would meet with the fans group and you know discuss it with them that leads us to um you know speaking about ownership obviously uh, you were a shareholder at arsenal for a long time and things changed it's the opening chapter in the book and you talk about that but what was it that made you think Stan Kroenke, when you were discussing with Stan Kroenke to come on board, what was it that made you think he would be a, a suitable partner or shareholder in Arsenal at that time? Was, was it a case that perhaps what was going on at Chelsea influenced the way you thought uh, football clubs needed to be owned or run or resourced? Well, I, I could see the way the game was going. Uh, obviously, with Chelsea was one, and obviously led then Man City and now Newcastle. And frankly, we didn't have that firepower in the club. And I knew that if we were going to challenge for the major honours, and that's what it's about, fans want, you want a winning team, we want titles. That's what we're in it for. I mean, it's it's not just the fact that you're playing a football match, it's the fact that there's something at stake in the football match. So you want to win them. And I know when I used to wake up every morning and I'd look in the mirror, what I would see is get a winning team. That's the most important. You get a winning team, everything flows from that. So you've got a challenge, but in order to do that, you need the, 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 the muscle, the financial muscle. And we didn't have it. Meanwhile, we shipped on debt of for nearly £415 million when we couldn't afford it. <coughs> so I felt that we do need it. We did need somebody who actually could bring in that, you know, give the, the club some extra stability when it was needed um, to get make sure we, we could get the... Uh, the, the best signings we could to make sure we could afford the right salaries. So, you know, we didn't have that money on the board between all the, the board members. They certainly didn't have that sort of money. So, Meanwhile, we should, we should be on debt of 450 million. So, I mean, when you sat down or when you met Stan Kroenke and, and you, I'm sure, looked at KSE as, a, as an owner of sports franchises in the US, I mean, did you feel like there was a compatibility there? I met him, uh, you know, the first thing I did, never mind owning the club, was for him to take a stake to have an interest in it. Sure. We, at the time, we had Granada, the, the media company, had 9.9% .9 shares in the club. And I encouraged him in the first instance to buy those shares, which he did. So that was the first stepping stone. Whether he would ever get control was, an, was fur, much further down the line. But at least I felt we had a shareholder who, if we needed it, could give us that leverage to compete against everybody else. Now, I wanted the, uh, the club to be well-placed in case we ha had to really uh, need extra funds for to, to make sure we didn't overstep our mark with our own debt and for transfers and salaries. I mean, you're quite upfront in the opening part of the book about how relationships at boardroom level um, weren't always as harmonious as they they might have been. And the way that that initial shareholding went down 
obviously had some serious consequences for you. And I think you said um, in the book, it's about um, maybe I should have been more upfront or maybe I should have uh, told them about this before. I mean, do you do you look back on that and have regrets about how that, that situation occurred? Well, it, you know, it's very difficult because um, I was trying to encourage outside investment and you know these sort of things have to be very discreet you can't let if you're talking to people you don't let too many people know about it um and obviously i'm a, I'm a board member and it was very important and i do believe that a board has a collegiate approach and that was important um but uh, whatever i was doing was in the best interest of the club I wasn't doing it for my personal interest at all because i believe that i had a, i was working that i was executive vice chairman you know, we had a wonderful, at the time before it all went wrong, which was about a year before, uh, uh, it was a year before I left, um, everything was very harmonious. Uh, and it was, a, it was a tragedy because particularly when, when the relationship split, but when obviously I left and Arsene was left on his own, it was a different, it was a different game at that stage for him. And he felt it very difficult. He admitted it on, on Monday night that virtually at the end of that season, he calls it a burnout, that he, he was split. But, you know, what should he do? And uh, certainly when he came to see me the night when I left, and he said, I, I think I should leave as well. Mm. Then I said, uh, I thought about it, and I said, I said, you shouldn't leave. You know, the club needs you. Subsequently, you sold your shares to Ali Sharuzmanov and um, Red and White Holdings uh, garnered a fairly significant stake in the club as well. And it created a, I don't know if Cold War is quite the right uh, phrasing, but over a long period of time, there was this situation where KSE had the vast majority of the shares, Ali Sharuzmanov had uh, most of the rest of them, and this cold war if you like i don't know that it was necessarily healthy for arsenal as a as a football club and as an institution when you look back on that do you have any do you have any regrets about that situation developing because of because of everything that had happened well firstly uh, it, it has to be acknowledged that i only had 15% shares so anybody buying my shares does not get control sure so after that so yes and, and it's not as if i didn't give which i did i mentioned it in the book uh, i did give first option to to stan Kroenke to buy those shares and we couldn't we didn't agree a deal we didn't agree a figure and these and these words to me were if he said uh, if you can do better do so don't blame you so uh, and that's what i did but nevertheless the fact that it happened to be at least Ruzman off buying them with his partner fight mishiri um I, I was going to sell my shares because I wasn't that big. I wasn't even being a backseat driver. I wasn't even in the car at the time. I'm out. So what am I going to do with my shares? I'm not going to hold a chunk of shares when I'm not even driving the car. Hmm. So I had to go somewhere. So it wasn't as if I, I, I didn't give Stan Kroenke an opportunity to buy them because I did. So that, that needs to be recorded loud and clear. Um, and then what happened after that? Yes, there was a bit of a standoff. And... Um, Alicia Osmanov got up, I think, to about 30%, and then in the end sold his shareholding to Stan Kroenke. Is it fair to say that your relationship with Arsene Wenger, beyond family, your wife, who you reference often in the book, but your relationship with Arsene is perhaps one of the greatest of your life? Yeah, I think he's my closest friend. Um, this day, obviously, he was there on Monday night at the launch of the book. I spoke to him today. Uh, we we're very close. And uh, we always will be. Um, uh, and that was one of the, the sad things because we had such such a great relationship. And um, uh, I felt that it was what I called unfinished business, Andrew. Mm. We had a lot more to do at the club together. And I felt that it was, it was a pity um, how it all ended. It didn't end well for him. I think he was poorly treated at the time when he left the club. Uh, and the fact that he hasn't been back since, you know, says a lot. And uh, certainly I was. I felt very bruised. I brutal, I think, in the book. Yourself and Arsene obviously worked really well together during that really successful period where probably the greatest Arsenal team I've ever seen 
went unbeaten. We won the double twice. There was a lot of success there. And after your departure, it took some time for for somebody to come in and do some of what you used to do. So Ivan Gazidis came in. But would it be fair to say that yourself and Arsene were kind of a, a double act in a way? I think one of the criticisms or or maybe um, one of the things that people might have said down the years was that perhaps Arsene should have been more open to the idea of a more modern structure at the football club. As, as football clubs got bigger, the manager had more and more to do and he was fairly autonomous in a lot of those things. So something like a technical director, something like a sporting director, whatever it was to, to help him with some of that burden. Much of that is what you probably did during your time there. You referenced some of the transfer deals, the way they, you know, you were responsible for this bit. Arson would say this, you go and get the player and bring him back. I know it's a bit simpl- uh, simplistic to say it, it all happened like that, but, you know, in tandem, you made some amazing transfer deals. Some amazing players came into this football club and maybe, I want to say, not necessarily left to his own devices, but having to do more and more and take on more responsibility in that regard, as well as coaching a team and managing a club, was was probably a bit too much for Arsene. Maybe. And I think certainly when I left, because I was, you know, he called it, I, I did the heavy lifting for him. Um, and, um, and that's why it was such a, a great shame. It, it, I didn't think it was in the club's best interest. And uh, obviously it took some time and uh, uh, and I felt for him badly because he, you know, I used to see him still regularly even when I left, that he, I could see he was physically and mentally being drained. Your relationships with the players are uh, come across very well in the book. Some of them, you know, obviously were there on Monday night. I saw some of the pictures as well. Um, you know, as an Arsenal fan, as you know, whatever about being a, a shareholder, was that one of the the privileges of your position in a, in a way? Is that closeness to the team? Because you know, I think every Arsenal fan listening to this would, you know, I wouldn't mind hanging out with the players. I wouldn't mind them being my friends beyond the professional relationship that you had with them. No, yeah, it was a working relation. It wasn't so much a friendly relation, but I did regard all the players as my children, because if I signed them, I felt responsible for them. And I would care for them. I would be worried if they had any problems, I'd want to know about it. I mean, Arsene, obviously, there was a division of responsibility where Arsene looked after everything on the playing field, on the playing side. That was it. And that was very clear. Um, and then anything other than that was my responsibility. But certainly when I went out, he would say, I want to buy this player, that player. Then it was over to me to go and deliver. And uh, I would do my very best to make sure that I did. And as I said on Monday night, uh, every time I, in the mornings when I got up to get dressed, I put my passport in my pocket because I didn't know where I was going to go in the afternoon. <laughs> if I want this player or that player. And I had to shoot to, to go and try and buy them. Um, uh, yes, so coming back to the relation with the players, I mean, the fact that we had seven of the Invincibles on Monday night. So we had Jens Lehmann, Laren, Colo Torre, Sol Campbell, Gilberto Silva, Thierry Henry, Martin Keown, Patrick Vieira from the Invincibles. Uh, and, and also we had Lee Dixon, Davos Suka, Anders Limpart, Paul Davis, and of course the irrepressible Ian Wright, who's just got funny bones. And on top of that, the whole event was hosted by Alex Scott very ably, and she did a great job. I mean, we had a a wonderful group, uh, right, and they all came. And we're now talking 18 to 20 years later, they all came. I think out of respect, certainly for us, and maybe a little bit for me as well, because it was my book launch, but they were all there. And this is now, you know, a long time afterwards. So that family, and I call it family, they, 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 they use that word more than I did. They all said that we were family together. Can I just ask you one final thing? You referenced it earlier, and it's about Arson and about the fact that he hasn't been back. And I think that's a, a shame. I think it's a cause of regret. Um, you know, for many fans, even if people were open to the idea of a new manager, he is still somebody who is held in a huge amount of esteem. We have Mikel Arteta, a former captain, as the manager of the club right now. Per Mertesacker, another former captain, is uh, the head of the academy. Edu is the technical director, one of the invincibles. These are all Arsene's players. Mikel Arteta has spoken and been asked many times about if Arson is going to come back. And he sounds like it's something that he would really like uh, for the football club, for the players. But do you see that 
happening. Obviously, you can't speak for arson, but clearly the issue must be higher up the food chain than the likes of Mikel Arteta and Per Mertesacker and Edu. Yeah, yeah, I think arson is still bruised, uh, and as indeed am I. Um, so in his own time, as and when he's ready, I mean, he said so on Monday night. Another reason he felt he didn't want to put anybody under any pressure with his presence, um, because, you know, he, he is such a, a major figure. A bit like sort of the the spectre, if you like, of Alex Ferguson looming over. I could certainly understand it while Unai Emery was, was in charge, but do you have any doubt that he would receive anything other than a really warm welcome? Because I know it did get a bit contentious towards the end with uh, some uh, some fans, but I think in general he would be uh, very warmly welcomed back by the vast majority of fans in the stadium. I, I would certainly hope so for what, he, what he's done there for his 22 years service to the club and my 24 years service. You'd think there would be some uh, uh, recognition. I agree. And there is talk about a statue for him, which uh, personally, I, I hope he, he, he does decide to unveil it if, as and when. Um, I think it would, he deserves that. He has been the most successful manager in Arsenal's history. For sure. For sure. Well, look, um, congratulations on the book. Um, Enjoy it. There's a lot more to it, as you know. Have you, did you manage to read it all? I certainly did, yeah. I got through it all, so uh, I wanted to make sure I'd read it before I, I spoke to you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Did I, you? I did. Andrew, what was your favourite part? I think probably some of the, the anecdotes, and I have to say, you, you mentioned that you're a man for humour. There's some lines in there, all right, that I'm not sure you're going to get a gig as a stand-up comedian anywhere, but they're still quite funny in the way they're delivered. Well, I do. I, I, uh, <laughs> I do like humour, and you need that humour particularly because the game is so highly pressured that you need that humour to release it, the re- release valve. So yeah. I'm pleased. Through. Well, I mean, also the thing I, you know, that that struck me from the book was you could correct me if I'm wrong here, but it does seem like for the most part you try and see the best in people, even referees. There was a great bit in the book where you're talking about, oh, come on, Arson, they're only human, and he's basically ready to tie them to a pole and burn them at the stake. Um, yeah, because he feels that uh, perhaps a decision didn't go in his way his when it should have done, and uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that was the only thing we ever disagreed about was referee. Well, I mean, that's one thing over a, a very long period of time. Again, listen, thank you very much indeed. We've got some copies of the book to give away uh, oh, well on the done. podcast as well. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope it all goes well. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andrew. My thanks to David Dean for talking to me about his brand new book. It's called Calling the Shots. It is out now wherever you get books. You can get it, of course, in your local independent bookstore. They would be very grateful for your business, I'm sure, but you can get it everywhere else as well, including here where we've got three copies. The publishers have very kindly given us three copies to give away in a competition. So here's the question. Uh, David Dean has told a story on more than one occasion about how he first met Arsene Wenger, who came to a game at Highbury, and David invited him out uh, for dinner, and they ended up back in, in David's house, I think it was. They were playing a party game. What was the party game that Arsene Wenger and David Dean played that night? Was it Twister, Charades, or Musical Chairs? Hmm, which could it be? Send your answers, please, to competition at arsblog.com. That is competition at arsblog.com. I will pick the winners and announce them on next week's show. So there you go. Right, that is that for this week's show. As always, thank you very much indeed uh, for being here and for listening, for downloading, for sharing, and all the rest of it. We will preview the Brentford game over on Patreon. Myself and Lewis Ambrose will have that podcast for you Friday afternoon. Patreon members, it will drop for you in your podcast app. If you'd like to sign up, it's a fiver a month. You get preview podcasts and all sorts of extra content, and it helps support everything that we do here on Arsblog. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash Arsblog. Join myself and James on Monday morning for an Arscast Extra. In the meantime, have yourselves a great weekend. Fingers crossed for a good result on Sunday, and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye.
Arsenal Football Club have today released a statement regarding the alleged fixture pileup. The Gunners have 72 fixtures scheduled in the month of October alone, and their statement reads simply WTF. What's this, Frank? A spokesperson for the Premier League called Frank said, They should really think about how many fantasy football points they can get. A spokesperson for Arsenal said, 